Living Corporate is brought to you by Pfizer. Every day, Pfizer colleagues work across developed and emerging markets to advance wellness, prevention, treatments, and cures that challenge the most feared diseases of our time. For more than 170 years, Pfizer has worked to make a difference for all of those who rely on them. Learn more at Pfizer.com. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And look, I'm excited. I'm thankful um, for just this entire year. So much has happened. So much change has been experienced, not just by me, but by my family, by the folks in the Living Corporate team. And I'm thankful for it. I really am. Um, It's interesting. Living Corporate is uh, a network, a media network that tells historically marginalized stories. And you know, of course, I really love and appreciate all of our guests that are able to be a part of this show and be a part of our network of shows. But there are some times when, like, the guests are really close to home. And so I'm really excited because this particular episode, we're talking about uh, being black, the intersection of race and gender within the uh, culinary world. And so I'm thankful for your uh, opportunity, really to listen to this conversation I had with not only someone I deeply respect, but someone who is, I consider part of my family. She's actually, um, I'm actually her children's godparent, godfather. And, um, her name is chef Raquel Hainsworth. And so I sit down with chef Hainsworth, chef Rocky and her business partner, chef Lindo, and talk about their business and talk a little bit about the things that black, folks experience and then again what black women experience in the world of um, in the culinary space and so I'm excited about this episode I'm excited about this conversation and I'm also excited about you checking out all of the content we have on our network but this is not really about that we'll talk about that at the back end of this uh, back end of this episode between now and then what I want you to do stay tuned the next interview you're going to hear is the interview between myself Chef Rocky Chef Lindo see you soon The Antigen Podcast returns with a three-part miniseries spotlighting maternal immunization. When it comes to vaccine development, there's been a shifting paradigm. Help protect pregnant women and their infants through research rather than from research. Join us this season to dive deeper into this topic, the history, challenges, innovations, and exciting developments to come. Subscribe and listen to The Antigen, powered by Pfizer, on your favorite podcast app. Chef Rocky, Chef Lindo, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? going What's going on? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Listen, um, I'm excited because we've had like executives, entrepreneurs, activists, uh, athletes, um, educators, authors, but we haven't had any chefs before on the on the Living Corporate uh, Network. Um, so, so first of all, like, let's, let's get started with just why chefing, like why, why this particular career choice? Well, first I want to thank you for having us on. And I, I would say that, um, chefing is important to me because I mean, I got started very, very young. My grandmother had me in the kitchen very young and just learning things, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like she was teaching me in order to be a chef. It actually wasn't until later on, um, actually after she passed um, some years, a, a few years ago, when I learned that she actually had her own restaurant back in the day. So us being in the kitchen, cooking, and just being being us, doing what you know we do in the kitchen, talking, talking about life, talking about uh, men, <laughs> talking about family. Um, it, it was a, a space where we were able to come together and be ourselves and and learn and it was something that actually i don't feel that my family really necessarily thought that i would get into you know folks usually have a a layout for your life and uh, they actually probably wanted me to go into healthcare, but uh, it was something that was very important to me that i find my path in life and being a chef uh, being in the kitchen cooking it felt at home you know it felt very very natural. It felt like it was just 
um, something that I didn't have to um, put on a facade for. I could just be myself, um, be creative, and and learn. As far as Chef Lindo, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my story is a little different. Uh, so I'm an artist by, by heart. Um, yeah, art is my thing. Uh, from drawing, I've been tattooing for over 12 years uh, also. And um, so when culinary, I mean, and all the women in my family cook amazing. You know, so I do kind of get it from my mom as well. Uh, but for me, my take on it was, it's, it's another form of art for me. That's why they call it, you know, culinary art. And it was something I wanted to tackle. And I was intrigued about, you know, just being able to express like actual art and put it on a plate, you know, and we're flavor is everything. And that's a part of the art too, you know, not just the visual and everything. So just being able to bring that all together and see somebody taste it and just kind of approve of your art, you know, and it's, it's like the same feeling of a Da Vinci painting, you know, he's seen this paint, like, you know, it's, it's the same thing of somebody saying, man, that's a nice drawing, you know, when somebody tastes our food, I'm like, man, this food is an amazing dish, or it looks amazing on a plate, like, that's what we strive for, and um, that art part of it, and then once I started, it was like, okay, you know, I, I like doing this, and just creating a love for it, and, and so my, mine is more raw to the form of art, because I'm just an artist at heart, and I love, I love cooking. And I love people enjoying it and enjoying your art. You know, an artist likes when people enjoy their art. I love it. That's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I'm curious. I know that, you know, we're here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about, uh, about Palette Fusion. Um, but I want to kind of understand a little bit more about just like navigating and existing as a black chef, right? Like, I mean, my so the premise of living corporate and frankly just kind of how I navigate the world is uh, anti-blackness is a global phenomena it is something that impacts like every aspect of our lived experience um, but I'm also like really I don't as, as as ignorant as may sound I don't I don't know if I think about it all the time when it comes to like the space of culinary arts of course I know that you know like white folks be out here with all the fancy restaurants you don't see a lot of really really big black restaurants stuff like that despite the fact that white people really don't season their food well which i want to talk about that too but i'm trying to i want to understand though y'all's perspective of like of like what has y'all's experience been in this space and like where have y'all seen or experienced difference um when it comes to just being and like trying to grow and build your career as as culinary artists so uh, yes, that is a big thing in this industry, and like you said, um, from the outside, everybody sees a white chef, a white chef, this and that. So we're, and that's big for us because we're here to like break those barriers of which you see. Like, we don't want our food to be just in one category, you know. And I don't want like a lot of people think, oh, black people can only cook this, or black people can only put together a plate that looks like, you know, just a bunch of good flavored food and just throw it on a plate. But we're, and that's that's the amazing thing about us because we're bringing the flavor that us black people just knew for so many years, you know, and just putting it on a plate and looking like the same thing that uh, a high-end restaurant is providing. And that's what we're striving for. We're trying to close that gap. And like you said, you don't, you don't, you know, once you think of all the big chefs, you, the only, a lot of the names that only come to your head is, you know, white people most of the time. But we're here to change that game. And it's, 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 it's an exciting road, um, just being able to close that gap and just, we're here to show people like, don't put yourself in a barrier as far as your craft. Like it doesn't have to be black people food. It don't have to be white people food. This is a culinary like we that's why we call it fusion. We fuse different, you know, culinary backgrounds when we're cooking and we're doing all these different things. So yes, it's amazing. I would say that uh for me being being black in the kitchen, um, it's essential. Going going into the kitchen, I would say, I would say the thing that people recognize first is that I'm a woman. You know, uh, being in the kitchen, being a chef, um, being in culinary art, it's a male dominated industry. 
And so first I feel that people recognize that I'm a woman, you know, and then they, they handle me different from there. Um, being a black woman on top of it, you know, because of all the, the stereotypes and, and, and things that go along with uh, black women, our, our attitude, our uh, bossiness, our sassiness and, you know, things like that. Um, that's one of those things that actually persuaded me to, to, to really just go out on my own, just branch out on my own, because it's one thing if I'm being uh, an asshole in my own kitchen, it's another thing when I'm being an asshole in, in, in maybe a white chef's kitchen, you know, at that point, then it's different. I am now, um, I have an attitude, I'm being that, that stereotypical Black woman and everything like that, whereas they could act the same way or even worse, <laughs> you know, and it's not even thought about twice. It's, it's you know, everyone gets in line easily, you know. But um, like you said, we're trying to, to close the gap on that. Um, we are wanting to make sure that we not only just seem like we're coming across as soul food, but like you said, a, a fusion of various cultures. You know, that, that's what's important. And um, not only that, but just introducing our people to other cuisines, the cuisines that they may not have even thought about tasting, you know, there's Indian dishes that, you know, people may have not even thought about tasting, but we put our own spin on it, but still make sure that it has the basis of that culture, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. No, I was going to say, so it's interesting because, you know, I know that, um, you know, Rocky, we talked about uh, your some of your experiences and stuff in culinary school. And I did, like I said, I made a slight joke, but it, I am kind of serious about it in terms of just, I do want to talk about like just the concept of seasoning your food, right? Like why is it that, um, that white com like, and, and we, t we joke about it all the time and living corporate is real talk in the corporate world. I ain't about to make no apology for this conversation. Why is it that white folks food is so often bland to the point now where it's like a joke? Like we just laugh about it. How like, and why is it like, even if you go to some high end restaurants and you say, like, yo, why is this not flavorful? It's, it's not, you feel like you're paying so much or you're missing something. Like it's, it's missing, like you have presentation, but it, it stops there, <laughs> you know? And that's one thing we want to make sure that we, that it, it reaches further past just the presentation. You understand that, that it starts with, um, you know, everyone eats with their eyes first, you know, but then when it hits the palate, uh, that's where I realized that, you know, it, it is something that um, Lance actually brought this to my attention, like maybe a month or so ago. And it's actually um, a historic, a very historical reason why white people's food is, is seasoned less. And it has something to do with, I mean, hundreds of years ago where um, I believe, it, and, and don't quote me on this, but basically uh, we were talking about how um, um, over in maybe European countries back in the day, how, um, they did try to, you know, intertwine cultures and, um, you know, people would come to various parts of Europe from other cultures and bring their spices and introduce their spices. But, um, things happen with as far as like trades and goods and, you know, um, from my understanding, white people, uh, their, their, <laughs> pride and things just kind of got in the way and said, Hey, we don't want y'all here. We don't want y'all stuff here. We don't want y'all spices. We don't want y'all seasonings. We don't want. And so they went back to, I mean, I, to me, they're the ones who took the L in the situation. <laughs> to me, to <laughs> you, so, to everybody. It doesn't taste so, good. Yeah. When we think about all of the other cultures, I mean, everyone has, I mean, from Asia and, and I mean, all the Asian countries, you know, from if you were going somewhere or if you're going to Thailand versus India, you know, there's various flavors and, and spices and things. I mean, you can tell the region of the world that this originated in, that cuisine originated in when it comes to a lot of, um, I'll say Caucasian cuisines, <laughs> it's, uh, I guess you'll be able to tell by the style of something, you know, if it's a French cuisine or something like that, but for the most part, they, that's something that no matter where you go, it seems 
like it's very similar, you know, it's, it's not going to be, oh, I could tell they use French seasonings on this. Like, no, <laughs> it's pretty I've much. I've never heard of, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of, <laughs> never heard of French seasonings. But, but you want to know, like, it, like the fact that you bring that up. So it's even a struggle, like going through culinary school, because even by textbook, they have it to where that's all a lot of these recipes, just salt and pepper. You know, so you're Something doing these recipes, you're doing these things, you know, you're doing these intricate dishes and learning these intricate dishes in, in class and it's just salt and pepper to taste, yeah. you know, so that's, and then that's where as a black person, which we've always done is, you know, kind of just adapt and kind of do a remix and do our own thing. And that's where we come in and that's where the artistry of it comes in. Okay. I think, and it's, and, and don't get it wrong. It's not as just simple as just Cajun seasons. I mean, it's so many different seasonings and spices and and her and you know yeah. herbs out there. Like it's it, it, it's so many out there, and you can do so many different combinations. So that's what we come in to say. Hmm. Well, if you put this spice with you know this, how would this taste? And, and you know that's that that's the beauty of it. But yeah, like you said, even in culinary school, they're kind of train us to salt and pepper a lot of these dishes to where afterwards we got out. Of, Coming to school and we do our dishes now. We put plenty of extra spices in what they yeah. said by the book, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I still appreciate culinary school yes, because definitely, you learn the techniques. The, yeah, the techniques, the processes of, of things, and that's something that um, my grandmother wasn't able to show me. You know, a lot of uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was more so soul food. You know, it's 1930s <laughs> born, and um, their background was soul food, you know, um, the collard greens, the oxtails, the um, fried fish, a lot of fried foods, you know, chitlins on New Year's, you know, and um, a lot of that stuff, um, it doesn't require a whole lot of, of intricate processes. However, culinary school introduces you to so much. I mean, from taking something as simple as mashed potatoes and turning that into robuchon potatoes, you know, that that's, it's, you learn so much and it's, it's just, I'm very appreciative of it. However, like you said, when it comes to seasonings and spices, yeah, you do learn a little bit because of, um, you know, like regional cuisines, uh, yes. you learn a, 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 about, uh, other spices and herbs and, um, how to incorporate those into your dishes. Uh, however, when it comes to European countries, it's, it's not a lot, even when it comes to, yeah, even when it comes to like, um, Regional cuisines, American cuisine. uh, yeah, American cuisines, and American you start breaking cuisine. it down of yeah. America, <laughs> you know, the so regions funny. of America. Yeah, over there in the, the the East Coast, New England and all that, you know, that's very, very brilliant. I made a lot of stuff in culinary school that, um, I said, you know, I don't. I don't need to take this on. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> y'all can have this though. Y'all want this? Y'all can have it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool. <laughs> so talk to me about like the the journey to to palate fusion. I mean, you know, like Rocky, like you, you know, and, and also, you know, we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about like just like the structure of palate fusion in terms of like what kind of um, rest, I want to say restaurant, I want to say food company because that's weird, but I want to talk a little bit about the structure but what led y'all to one another to really kind of to, to create this together? Well, I, I know that, uh, you know, my background, actually, as a matter of fact, Candace, your wife went to, um, it wasn't an orientation. It was like a meet and greet at the Art Institute um, when I first was getting very interested in, in going. And I looked up a lot of information. I saw that they were having a meet and greet. Candace went with me and um, we had an amazing time. I learned so much. After that, I mean, I was sold. Um, this is where I was going to school. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to be able to walk the same halls as Chef Chris Shepard and, and, and be able to, um, learn so much. Um, from after culinary school, I would say, um, actually during culinary school, I worked in a couple kitchens. I did, um, Bar Louis, uh, just to get my, my feet wet because you had to have that actual, you know, work credit for graduation. And so I wanted to get in the kitchen and get um, that industrial kitchen experience. And and from there, I went to Sweetwater Country Club, where I learned 
a little more. Um, as far as the the vibe, the energy, I definitely would have preferred the bar more. <laughs> um, it was just the energy, the people. Um, it was way different. And then at um, the country club, it was a much the structure was a lot stricter than Bar Louis. You know, you might have a twerk contest going on in the kitchen at Bar Louis. Over at the country club, it was very, there was no music. <laughs> there was gray flooring. I actually had my very, my first and only panic attack at the country club, um, getting built right before graduation. But um, leading to, going from there, um, I started, Midnight cravings, and with midnight cravings, I was doing a lot of baking, a lot of pastries, doing a little, you know, pop ups here and there. Um, really, just accepting orders for uh, bake sales and um, cakes and whatnot, and getting those orders off, even shipping. And so that's how I started to really grow a brand for myself. Um, I stopped for a while because I just felt like I wasn't. I wasn't in a, I wasn't being inspired. I didn't have that motivation. So I really did fall off a little bit when it came to baking and pastry. Uh, but then, um, after a friend of mine committed suicide, it, it really did inspire me to get back into the kitchen. Something that he also enjoyed doing was, um, cooking, baking and everything. And it really inspired me to, um, go and do what I set out for, finish what I set out for, you know? And so that's when, uh, chef Angela, um, I, I had, and and this is crazy because I never watch anybody's stories on social media, but I, I was getting pictures and everything together for his funeral. And I clicked on chef Angela's story and I saw that she was having a, an event at her kitchen. And when I went, uh, we got to talking about, um, you know, the, the kitchen space and how, you know, she just, she needs a lot of help. She's really trying to grow her brand. And, uh, so that's when we decided to collaborate. And at that point, that's when this guy here, <laughs> uh, slid into the DMs. Basically, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Basically, did the, did same the same thing. thing that she did. Yeah. And he slid into the DMs and, and, um, we ended up working a event together at the Vantage and it went, it went really well. We love the um, the chemistry, the energy. It was like he and I had been working together for for years, and uh, that was just my way of of letting him stage and see how we work together, see where his um, his knowledge was at when it came to cooking, see where his knowledge was at when it came to uh, improvising. We had to actually change the menu. Um, for the yeah one one of the nights for the dinner course and it was an entire weekend thing and so just on the fly just seeing you know how he um how he handled that and we ended up um interviewing and bringing him on and um fast forward a few months it didn't work out between us and chef angela with uh, the partnership and we were like man where's this gonna go and then he and i did a a pop-up event uh, called the Naughty List. We did their first pop-up event and it was so inspiring. It was, when I tell you that, I mean, the food, we sold out. That was my very first time selling out mm-hmm. um, with, I mean, quickly within maybe two hours and the event was still had like another four hours to go. Um, we just sold out because of the flavor, because of, you know, what we do and the, the incorporation of, uh, like, even with the boudin rolls, our boudin rolls are like one of the, the top sellers where, you know, traditional boudin. And, but instead, um, we're, instead of it being inside of a casing, we actually use spring rolls and the spring roll wrappers to give that, that crunchy. And it was so funny because my sister in law, she's, she's Jamaican and we introduced, um, boudin to her for the very first time. She was like, this is, I don't like this. This is not, this is not it. And so I made the the boudin and the boudin rolls for her. And now out there in Colorado, she's ordering <laughs> like, okay, what all you need? You need dry ice. You need, you know, X, Y, Z, what all do you need to ship, uh, you know, this stuff out here to us because I got to have more of it. And so it's just about even, like you said, the fusion of cuisines, um, you know, no one, I mean, you have boudin rolls, but I mean, who's really putting it inside of spring roll wrappers and changing, you know, changing it from a traditional, a traditional soul food, you know, item to 
hey, let's let's advance it. Let's let's progress. You know, let's progress the culture a little bit. And um, that's something where now you can go a lot of places. You see boudin rolls on the menu, and it's like, hey, let's see how they how they compare to mine though. <laughs> Um, but our our um, partnership has definitely been a blessing. I would say that um, finding each other, uh, that's it's pure luck, <laughs> you know, to find somebody who has the same energy, the same work ethics, the same um, business mentality, if not more, you know, that that's essential because, you know, I was doing pop-up events and, and catering and things on my own. That was very hard, <laughs> very hard. And I know that um, that was an experience that taught me that I definitely need a partner in it. And I'm I'm very blessed to have found Chef Lindo to, to steer this with me. You know, Chef Lindo, like I'm curious, as you think about this space and, and it's something that Raquel, Chef, Ra- uh, Chef Raquel, Chef Rocky said at the top of this interview uh, about I think the first thing he noticed is I'm a woman. Like, what ways are you leveraging your privilege as a black man to support and advocate for her as a as a partner um, in y'all's business? Well, uh, just my part is just kind of making everything comfortable and kind of paving a comfortable route for us when it comes to dealing with um, outside parties and just, I mean. You do have, like she said, like it, just a black woman by herself, or by herself going into certain business scenarios. Um, they can see as, for, okay, we're going to take advantage of this because, like, you know, she might not know. Whereas, actually, Rocky does know a lot. Like, you know, they they would have had the wrong one anyway. But, you know, if they, you know, you just seeing that extra black man there. It just gives that extra security. And then we both like, you know, we're both pretty smart people. So when it comes to doing business, uh, we, you know, we talk, we'll talk to talk, but we'll actually walk the walk too when it comes down to doing this business. But yeah, it's just, just having a backup person, period. I'm just there, you know, we, we're here to just kind of support each other. Um, and just, you know, just do the best business possible. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely that back of support. Yeah, yeah, because we it, it's been times where um even with a, a, a certain I won't I won't name the facility, but even when doing you know negotiations and and business um you know just business deals with them, it was it, it was quick. Just even from the the very first time meeting with them afterwards, uh, their representative was like, "Well, I'd rather just deal with you than him." Um, he comes on, he comes on strong, you know, type thing. And it's like, mm, that's interesting. And, you know, and whereas you think that you can get me alone to, like you said, either try to, you think in your mind that, you know, you're going to get over on me. Little do you know, I'm not the one, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the person that I sit back and I observe. I like to take in the situation and really kind of read people's vibes um, and, and, and feel out fill out the, the scenario before I just jump into it. And when with him being there, it allows me the opportunity to be able to do that because it's like almost like you're being double teamed, but you don't necessarily know it because you think that I'm the one that's, that's quiet and reserved and um, maybe a little pushover, but no. Um, I will say a, a lot of people being that we are a, a male and female team, they do assume that we're married and we're not. <laughs> we're just, you know, great friends. We're business partners. But I will say that it has also worked in our advantage uh, because, again, I'm not I'm not easily, you know, in that predicament where they feel that they can take advantage of me. And, you know, like I said, this is a male dominated industry. So they see a woman as like, oh, yeah, we can we can lowball her. We can, you know, uh, maybe sweet talk her into X, Y and Z. I don't know. <laughs> it's not gonna happen yeah and we like surprising people with our product and our work you know at the end of the day like as black people i just like and love when we just surprise people you know and, and when they expect you don't know how many times like uh, we have a certain client that's inquiring or 
a certain gig and then they see our product and they're like, oh, oh, so y'all a chef shit. Like, you know, and it's crazy because if a white person would have came to you and said, I have a catering, I'm a private chef, off top, they would have expected them to have an elegant menu, right? But, you know, as black people, when we say, oh, yeah, we're private chefs and we got this, check out our, pro-, you don't know how many times we see, we can watch the person's face and be like, oh, so they were surprised. It's like they expected to see, you know, just some food thrown on the plate, you know, and even so if it that, is a soul food plate, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's another struggle when it comes to this industry, too. But we're here to just keep surprising people. That's why we're, like, we tell people to go to our Instagram and stuff and you look at our plates. We get it all the time. Like people are actually surprised and they would straight up tell us, like, we didn't expect for it to be like that. Like, well, what did you mean we, when we told you that we were chefs? Like, you know, mm-hmm. that we, you know, we, we're not just cooks, you know, we're chefs. You know, l- let's talk a little bit about, you know, Palo Future, especially as we look at like the next, you know, 18 months. You know, there's a lot of concerns around uh, the economy, potential recession and things of that nature. Like, you know, how, how, what, how do y'all feel about, let's say between now and like the end of 2023 and like, what excites y'all, or maybe what what keeps y'all up at night? Like, what are y'all what are y'all thinking about? People always eat food. Yeah. <laughs> That's something that we we noticed that even with COVID, um, <laughs> that industry thrived. Uh, private chef experiences adapting. Yeah, private chef experiences was a thing that um, really took off. Where, um, well, you know, we're not going out to restaurants like that or bars like that, but we still want to be able to have that experience. We want to be able to have great food. Um, would you be able to come to our home and, you know, maybe just do, do a night of a, a private chef experience? That was something that um, I really had to start promoting because that's been, um, that was that was the thing, the, the, the area in in our business that really took off. Uh, was the private chef experience and um like i said even doing a, an entire weekend people even book us for entire weekends you know multiple courses you know okay. wake up breakfast later lunch dinner you know we do we're gonna do this all weekend <laughs> good thing about the food industry recession or not people are going to eat and people are going to spend good money for good food you know how many people you know you know barely make enough and still will go out to eat at that nice restaurant every once in a while so that's the good thing about this food industry. But the better thing is how we're adapting to the new norm of after COVID and everything. So the fact that we started during that, we have that in our bag now, being able to adapt working, you know, right after a lockdown or working when everybody doesn't want to be, you know, we've had uh, what a client wanted us to, you know, we want vaccine cards. Like from yeah. the chef, we had to prove, you know, proof of vac- vaccine and stuff like that. Like it's just being able to adapt. But one, the good thing is the food industry and uh, people always eat. But if you can adapt with that, you know, like, I mean, the rest, okay, the fast food places, McDonald's and all those places, they didn't shut down. They went all the way. They went primary drive through. Remember, they went 100% drive through and they were killing it. And they didn't have to supply the staff for the, you know, for the inside and everything. So they loved it. I bet you they loved it, you know. So it's just it's just being able to adapt. So what you can adapt with that way, um, in in whatever your business is, you know, sometimes it's just gonna be a wrench that gets thrown in. But once you can kind of ride around it and just okay, that's how this is gonna be. Sometimes it's just how it's gonna be for now on. You know, like gas prices might not never go back down to <laughs> once forty forty nine. It might just be at one thing, you know, and it's just being able to adapt to make up for that change. You know, that's what, you know, being in business or just actually living life is about. And not only that, but um being able to um utilize inventories, for instance, if we have um uh, extra something from a private chef experience or something from, from catering. Uh, pop of events, pop of events. Um, that is something that that was something that was a, a confidence builder for me, you know, because I I got to see real, you know, strangers. first, yeah, strangers, people who don't know me at all. Um, these aren't clients. These aren't you know people that have ever met me before. Um, come in and buy stuff, and we utilize the you know whatever inventory we may have left from a. Um, 
a, a different a different gig, a different event, and utilize that at a pop up event and sell out. <laughs> you know, you may have to you know add a little bit more to inventory, but I mean, it, it, it like you said, it's adapting to what you need in order to make sure that um, uh, food costs and waste that you know that stays within a certain margin. That's what's in, important because you know the food industry is not a cheap industry to be in. Um, it's <laughs> just off the rip, just just going and buying. You already know inflation on um, grocery and and everything. It is not we take uh, cheap. hit, and we. I mean, it's just like a business. We gotta pass it down. Some like if the cost of this went up, I give you an example. Oxtails is a, a big deal. We we make oxtail rolls and we make an oxtail dish. But with the price of oxtails last year went up, tripled the like normal, like $75 for a little pack of oxtails. And we were getting hit across the head. But and to, to, I'm sorry, but to, to tie back into what he was saying, people were still spending the money on it. It got to the point we where we took it off the menu and they were like, well, y'all need to just raise the prices yeah. in order to keep them on the menu. Our customers told us that, you know, yeah. we had a customer told us that. So we was like, yeah. It's kind of high right now, you know, with everything going up with that in particular dish. And I told her, I was like, I don't, we don't want to just, you know, charge y'all no outrageous. She said, why not? She said, if the price, if the cost of the product is higher and you've got something that you want to stand on, I'm going to pay for it. She told us, I'll pay for it. I'm ready. And we brought them back and, and they sold out. And sold <laughs> and they sold out. You know, if people, one thing we are realizing that people will pay, pay for, for good food. Good food. They will. And Especially as, black people. Yeah. You see black people. Like, yeah. we don't line up outside of a bad restaurant. In, yeah. in my line, we don't stand in long lines for bad food. Not at all. There, is nev- there has never been a situation in my whole life where I have, like, stayed in a line, and I got to the end of that line, and that food wasn't smacking. Like, that food every yeah. time and it you had to hitting. get verification from somebody else before to, to, for yeah. you to even stand in that line. Exactly. You know? So that's one thing, and, and, and that's what I like about our people. You know, we'll stand on something if it, you know, just and it support the culture. That's what that's what we love about our people. You know, I was, and I, I, I saw these two women in in Walgreens the other day, and they were just, they didn't know each other, but they were just talking. They ended up meeting in the uh, frozen section and got to talking over ice cream, <laughs> and um, they got to talking about black restaurants. It was some restaurant that I, I, I couldn't, you know, I wasn't eavesdropping too hard, but what really caught me was, you know, oh, they're expensive, but it's worth it. And I'll support our people if the food is good, you know, and that was something that I want to hear that, you know what I'm saying? They, I, I never introduced myself to them. I didn't butt in on their conversation or anything like that. I wasn't trying to congregate by the ice cream, but <laughs> 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 I just, um, that was something that I feel that maybe God put that there so that I could hear that. You know what I'm saying? Like that was, I needed to hear that. I needed that reassurance because sometimes as a, as a, as a black chef, you're like, are my prices too high? You know, like, am I not worth it? Am I? Because we're not a cheap place. You know, we're not cheap, but we don't want to be cheap because we're literally like, when we tell people like all these recipes and all this stuff is made scratch, we're putting it on that plate for it to be like something big, you know? So, and, but on the on the same time, we definitely will never charge somebody something that we don't feel that it's worth charging. Yeah, you know, I do feel like when you pay for any type of product, you got the cheap products, you have the little higher price products that you're gonna pay more for, but it's worth it, and then you got the overpriced products. You know, you know. So we're trying to stay in that. You know, you're gonna pay more, but I I want you when you get up from eating this plate to say, you know what, I'll come back. And I'll buy that again mm-hmm. for the same price, you know, and if something goes up and, the, you know, the price of things go up, I'll even pay the difference then. Yeah. And that's what we want. And we feel like we get that. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a dope conversation, y'all. Um, you know what? Let me ask. I'll ask this one last question. It's kind of silly, but it is relevant. You know, for, for, for food entrepreneurs out here trying to do their thing, um, you know, recently we saw, we continue to see, uh, the the pink sauce lady. Um, oh my god! <laughs> you see, okay, uh, Chef reaction. You see how we both. My wife was showing me that it is cringeworthy. 
okay. my my husband was showing it to me the other day, and it's so funny because my sister in law is in town right now. You can't play with food. You um, can't. and she showed it to me as well. She doesn't even have social media, but she was like, "What's going on with this with this pink sauce?" <laughs> um. I have not tried the pink sauce, and so I will not speak on the flavor of the pink sauce. I hear that it's not something that you can compare to other sauces. I haven't heard anyone say, mm, kind of like maybe like a barbecue sauce, a little tangy, you know, a little sweet. You know, it's, it's, I ha- that's not what I, I haven't seen anyone say, oh, okay, it's like kind of like a spicy ranch or, you know, something like that. No one has been able to pinpoint what it is. However, I will speak on maybe the preservatives and, um, you know, things of that sort, because I've, I've seen people get um, bottles of it and bloated, bottle. bloated bottles or the bottles have already exploded. And um, that's something you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't that's people's health. Like the yeah. food industry is serious. Like when we cook and they make you take these, but like it's a lot of health things. That's why you gotta send certain things through the FDA. Yeah. You know, it, like You're for that approval. Selling it, because <laughs> like you don't like. I mean, you might know thirty two properties of this ingredient, but that that thirty third property was something that it reacted a certain way in this temperature that you didn't know. Like it's certain yeah. things. Like you can't play with people for like. I've seen it, and I've seen. I think one video they was comparing the bottles and it was like different colors, different yeah. hues. Like, so it's not even a consistent, you know, recipe at that point. So like, you, every, I mean, and I think they passed, I don't know when they passed the law, but where they had to, um, all the ingredients had to have, like everything packaged in America had to have the calorie counts and everything. Remember when they first start, like you have to have, so you can't expect to be, so specific with the ingredients on the back if the color in this one is different than the color this one apparently this one got more of something so i just feel like i mean like she said i can't speak on the taste and i I wish people well in their like whatever their business is i just say be careful when you get into a certain industry that you think like oh i'm gonna make quick dollar i'm not a chef but this is you know i make this sauce and i'm gonna send it all all over the united states all over the world without doing your research because lawsuits and oh my god people's health you do not want to play with that that's all i say about that but i mean i praise her hustle on it you know yeah, yeah. and she to. she got that sauce out twenty dollars about like on the hustle side like twenty dollars a bottle she got <laughs> that sauce it. out you know you on that side it. of it <laughs> and people know like when forbes has done an article on you First even if it's not yeah. uh in good light <laughs> you know um still Forbes did an article on well, you. I believe and... you win if you can get black people to eat a sauce that's the color Pepto Bismol. Okay, like I thought we were scarred by Pepto Bismol. Like... I, I, I'm telling you, I was over here like trying not to hurl when I saw the videos because that color and it just, I, it just it, made me. Yeah, yeah. It, didn't, it didn't do it for so, me. So you know how you see how that did that? That's when we say the artistry of it comes all the way back from the site and everything. Yeah. Like you can throw your whole appetite out. Yeah. You have to eat with people eat with their eyes first. Presentation is is everything, and I'm not saying that there's you know um, not any any pink food. I'm mean, like you know you can go with so many you know fruits that'll give off I that that color, and, but um, it's it again it's got to be the way you present it. I'm I'm just not the very first time I saw it, I was like Pepto, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's the immediate correlation. I had nothing yeah. else to. Um, to compare, to compare it to, to, to it. like in a good way, you know. So yeah. that was my immediate reaction. And you want to make sure that um, when people see something, they are relating it to something, you know, positive. That you know they have a a positive correlation with your product. And um, you know, I still wish her the best. I'm not sure of her name, but I know that this pink sauce is everywhere. Like Chef Lindo said, I respect the hustle. I respect the entrepreneurship with anyone because it's not easy. Um, it's not easy at all. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. Um, so I respect her in that. I just feel that there's, um, you know, a lot that she's probably learning right now. And I hope that she takes those those lessons. And build a great product. Because right now, she already got the fan base kind of. All she got to do is tighten it up and she can resell, you know. We, she knows she can get off twenty dollar bottles. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So it, and, she and knows that much for sure. You know. Yeah, I would take it as a trial. Take it as a learning experience. 
say to chalk it up to the game and and keep on pushing. You already got the like I said, if Forbes is doing articles on you, <laughs> you know, go ahead and, and and run with it. Tighten up your product and and keep on pushing. Well, look, y'all. I appreciate y'all coming on. Y'all are friends of the show. Um, the company name is Palette Fusion. I know y'all not mailing plates out right now, y'all, <laughs> aka Pink Sauce Lady. But what y'all are doing is um, y'all are creating um, a great product, an inclusive um, experience, right? You talked a little bit about how you know you're trying, you're, you're bringing in different. Literally, it's in the title, Palette Fusion. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm excited for y'all. I appreciate y'all's time. I hope that. Uh, I wish y'all all the best. And listen, y'all, if y'all ever in Houston, y'all trying to check out some good food. Also, what we didn't talk about, but I'm going to shout it out anyway, is the inclusiveness of the inclusivity of your actual of your menu itself in terms of the fact that um, you have modifications and things for those who have gluten allergies or maybe who are vegan or vegetarian. Like you, y'all are smoking that. I mean, yeah. I mean, how did you like the, the paleo oatmeal cream pies? I was just about to say, yes, I, for my <laughs> birthday. Raquel, Chef Rocky, made me some paleo non-sugar added. What did you use for the sugar? What did you use? You used... Um, I used uh, date syrup. Um, date syrup. I believe a little mm-hmm. molasses went into it. Uh, mm-hmm. No, not in that one. Maybe into the cookie. The molasses went into the, the cookie, but mm-hmm. not in... But no sugar added. Um, I ended up doing... Um, it's called... Is it monk? Monk, it was monk fruit. monk fruit. Yeah, the monk, monk fruit, fruit was the sweetener in it. That's so what it incre- was. So incredible that those things tasted like. The, first of all, those tasted better than the cream, than the cream pies to me. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed mm-hmm. them, but that's what I mean. Just like y'all's creativity and, um, frankly, like love that y'all have for the art and for the people that you serve to create. Um, you know, food. Um, what's the word? Uh, cuisine experiences that are that are meaningful. So again, I appreciate y'all and I will look forward to having y'all back soon. Yes, definitely. Make sure y'all follow us at palette fusion HTX on Instagram and, and on Facebook and on not Twitter, but on TikTok, please. All right. I'm all the links are going to be in the show notes. So make sure y'all check it out. Pull over the side of the road, put your hazards on, (laughs) stop the car, put it in park, Turn the gas off. And when you open see up the, the phone, click the links and follow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Do it right now. Follow right, right now. <laughs> thank you All so right. much thank for you. having us, Zach. Talk to y'all soon. Peace, y'all. And we are back. Yo, I just want to thank Chef Rocky, Chef Lindo again. Shout out to Palette Fusion. Shout out to Houston. You know, see, we don't even do a lot of like local spotlights right but like palette fusion in houston is near and dear right it's this they're they're actively challenging the status quo they're building something new and they're pursuing their dreams and they're being unapologetic about it all the while and so my hope is that you especially in this holiday season support local black businesses support black women believe black women and uh, be an advocate where you can right what i really appreciated about you know, Chef Lindo is he acknowledges his privilege and his power and his voice and him being a, an active and engaged partner and not just muling um, Chef Rocky to death. Right. Which is what often happens. Right. Black women are overworked. You've heard this several times on Living Corporate's content channels uh, We are, you know, our stance because the data shows it to be so and history shows it to be so black women are the most underappreciated, overworked people in the world. And so it's important, right, where you can, especially men, particularly black men, let's practice true allyship and and support and love by uplifting everyone else around us. Right. Let's do that. Anyway, I want to make sure that y'all know that the merch is up. All right. So hoodies, jackets, you know, I'm saying masks, because still a pandemic outside. What's up? Um, You know, I'm saying baby clothes, you know, I mean, hats. We got everything on the merch store. So make sure you slide over to livingcorporate.shop. Link in the bio. Link in the bio. Link in the bio. Make sure you give it a click. And um, you know what I'm saying? It's cold outside. especially It's cold in Houston. You see, man, look, listen, listen, man. It's climate change. It's crazy. You see how cold it's going to be this winter? If you haven't gotten the Living Corporate hoodie yet, I don't really know what you're doing. Because they're priced at value. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not 
And no shade to other people that be charging like seventy, eighty dollars for their hoodies. Like my hoodies just like under forty dollars. You know what I'm saying? Like we we out here trying to like really bless y'all, right? This is literally just to spread the word. You know what I'm saying? To to really help help us get the word out uh, for living corporate by buying an affordably, accessibly priced. You know what I'm saying? Accessibly priced. Yeah, accessibly priced hoodie. You know what I mean? You got a little baby. You want them to look cute. You want them to also make sure that they realize that, um, you know, that their joy is rebellion. I'm saying, okay, well, go ahead and get them that onesie. You know what I mean? You got a little kid. You know, you want them to look kind of cute, kind of swaggy. Look, we got the hoodies in kid sizes too, and they're unisex. You know what I mean? Like it's they're accessible. You know what I mean? They're you know so so bless yourself, bless living corporate. You know, it'd be a great Christmas present. You know what I mean? Like, for real, that'd be a great Christmas present, straight up. So, make sure you check out the merch. What else? You know, give us five stars if you haven't already. We're getting really close to 300. Got, like, what, 14, 15 to go? I'm looking at the numbers. It's, I mean, I, I you saw me make the little announcement on Twitter. We, we, we finally hit the milestone of a million downloads. You know what I'm saying? So, it's not like y'all ain't out there. <laughs> y'all out there. Cause I've been looking at that data. It's a megaphone is accurate. You know what I'm saying? The megaphone is accurate. So I know y'all out there listening. So you know what I'm saying? Just, just slide through Apple and just give us, give us some little five stars. Don't give us four and be a hater either. I see some of y'all be giving me four stars and not just me. You know what I'm saying? Like respect to the entire living corporate team. Give us five stars on the pods. You know what I mean? Apple podcast, slide through, do your thing. I don't take you but a second. You don't have to tarry too long. You know what I'm saying? And um, give us a review. What else? Since I'm in the since I'm in the demanding mood <laughs> at the end of the show, you know. Look, um, the last thing I'll say because you know we have a couple more episodes. We wrap up the year, and then we get ready for 2023. Don't forget that the biggest weapon you have is your voice, right? Like a lot of us feel like, okay, if I shrink myself and I shrink myself strategically, eventually I'll get this title, I'll get this thing, I'll get this whatever that allows me to show up authentically. Listen, the thing that allows you to show up authentically is yourself. All right. Don't gamble on you getting to a certain space and you, first of all, don't gamble on you getting to that level because you may never get there and don't gamble on the fact that you'll still recognize yourself when you get there. Use your voice today. You know what I'm saying? Like be an advocate for change today. Advocate for yourself. Respect yourself. Love yourself today. All right. All right, y'all. That's been Zach living corporate. We make sure to catch y'all. Just to catch y'all soon. You know what I mean? And uh, we love you. And I should, I did all the stuff. So click the link in the show notes. I really got much else to say. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm look, I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm thankful. I appreciate you. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.